Good morning again from New York City. Raining outside. Now I did the Klein-Gordon equation as part one of relativistic quantum mechanics. The Klein-Gordon equation arises out of the energy equation. Where we put in for the operators E and P. And we arrive at the Klein Gordon equation, which who has a, which has a solution, which is a scalar field. All right, so we want to go from the Klein-Gordon equation now to a field whose solution contains spin. In other words, that extra degree of freedom, right? Intrinsic spin, if you like, and it's still not fully understood what it is, but it's certainly an extra degree of freedom. And angular momentum comes into this. At one point, we will take a break and discuss the Dirac, sorry, the Pauli matrices. In this case here, I'm just assuming that you're familiar with them and we'll kind of throw them in. The Pauli matrices, yeah, they're in there. Now the Pauli matrices have a history in themselves. Um, they really begin with uh, William Rowan Hamilton in about 1846, uh, quaternions. So uh, I guess they're a modern day version of quaternions. So we want to make this thing now contain spin. So we'll say, let the let there exist a new field, which we'll call psi. Now, it will have four components. We say this in retrospect. It will actually break down and become a bispinner. So what we want is we want to seek an equation which is going to be first order in time and first order in, sorry, the time derivative and first order also in space derivative. So the equation of the form of, uh, is what we look for. Um, Okay, this is going to be the momentum operator, really, actually. This is all going to be multiplied by C. This is a capital C, and this is a small c. Now, this all operates on this side here, which we'll call We'll do it like that, just for, for just for now. Okay. So it will turn out that these guys here will have a matrix structure, and there'll be a matrix structure on front of this one as well. So let's put those things in now. They're not constants. They're going to be because this is all operating on a four-component uh, column vector. So therefore, then we have to have components. 4x4 four four matrices in here as well. So we put those things in. We're going to call these alpha matrices for now. I goes from 1 to x, 1 to x3. Okay, and the usual notation. And beta is going to have a certain form. Okay? So we're going to take this structure and we're going to square it because we are going to require that this reduces in its square to the Klein Gordon equation. So when we square this, then we want to see it becoming the Klein Gordon equation. So let's square the terms. Let's square this term here first.
and the derivative is acting on the psi vector. I'm going to square that term there. To square this term here, straight away you can see that we're getting to the klein gordon equation with the c squared, p squared term, just with some requirements for these guys here. And we also have the cross terms. So c squared, let's see what the cross term is going to be. These things cross this times this times this times this. So it's going to be c cubed m beta and they're the cross terms. Now all of these operate on the four component vector psi. Okay, so now to get this reduction as we require, we have a component here uh, we have a, we have this as unity, but in the, if we go to four dimensions, in other words, we take away just the scalar structure and we include the four component spinner to operate on, that has to do that, then this must have a matrix structure as well as these things here. So let's see what kind of matrix structure we can do. We start with the simplest one first. So we require beta squared equals 1. Now, there are many different solutions to, to, for this to become 1. And we're going to say, let this cross term vanish. To get the cross term to vanish, we'll say, take out the pi and this part here. become zero. Okay? Now what about this guy here? Well, we know what we're going to use for this. There is a well-known result for the sigma matrices. Commutator gives me a delta function. Okay? Alright, so now let's get rid of all this uh, stuff on the board which is getting look, looking confusing. So I'm going to go and address this issue here. There are many different forms of matrices which will turn out to give us these kind of results. Let's look at this term here. I'm not going to write the form of the Pauli matrices down straight away. We're just going to look at their algebra. I will do at some point look at them closely. Almost nobody can derive the Pauli matrices. Even if you go on the web and you look, you Google, derive the Pauli matrices, you'll get really dumb answers. Like, you know, people just write them down and start using them, but they never uh, obtain them. The reason is it's not easy, okay? That's a whole separate lecture. So, these. This anti-commutator here, we said, is going to give me two 
delta ij. So if I just divide this whole thing by 2, I get delta ij. So divide that by 2, and I just get delta ij for that. So this whole thing here is c squared p i p j uh, delta ij, which is c squared p i p i, which is c squared p squared as required. Okay? Now, we know the form of our early matrices. It's going to be the sigma i. Not quite though, all right? We're going to require, I, sh I shouldn't have done this in, I did, shouldn't have put this in straight away, we're requiring this. this of them. So there are the three requirements of our matrix, matrices. Now this is satisfied with the following. Now we say a representation or a solution to these requirements is as follows. I see. Now, our requirements are satisfied with those two uh, examples, and let's make sure that I got that right. The other way around. Has to be because it has to be diagonal one. All right. So now we have the Dirac equation. We get the Dirac equation with these results. This representation of the alpha matrices, the beta ma matrix, and the Dirac equation will look like this. Now let me see if I got a plus or a minus sign there. Yeah, that's correct. All right. Get your heads around that, because I'm going to erase this part and transport that up here and look at it further. What I want to do is show what we're working with here. What does this structure become like? OK? There's our matrices. I'm going to put those upstairs. So I'll take away everything that I don't need and put what we want upstairs. Okay. So we don't 
don't need this for now. This is the Dirac equation. So we look at a closer, we have a closer look at its structure. So I put my glasses somewhere and I don't know where they are. operating on the side. Okay. Alpha I P I is going to be Now the structure here is the alpha I, so we go like this. And now with the beta part, now this is really like this, yeah, and these sigma i's are 2 by 2 matrices as well, so this is a 4 by 4 structure, this is a 4 by 4 structure, and they all add, uh, act on psi. Now what we're going to do is this. We're going to split psi. We're going to say let psi be a bispinner. And it really is like this. Okay, but for now I'll just say this is a two-component spinner, this is a two-component spinner, this is a four-component object or a bi-spinner. So we'll work out these matrices now. Okay, so I add that, well actually I'll put them in to make it clear. or sets of them to be added together. And they all act on this chi. I didn't make it very clear. So I'm going to join these two together now. We add them. mc squared plus 0 is mc squared. 0 plus pici with a positive sign is that. 0 plus this one is minus And don't forget, this is the i, and this is a small i, index i. And minus m c squared plus 0 is m c squared, the minus sign. Operate on the phi and the chi. 
Let me get rid of all the garbage on the board now. Okay. Don't leave those. Don't need this. All we need is this one. This here. We're representing two, uh, sorry, these two spinners represent two spin half objects with left and right hand components. We will look into these more closely as we get into it, but one step at a time. Right? So let's multiply out this object here. MC squared phi plus ICPI chi. And the same thing. To multiply matrices, we take them, grab them, move them down, and add a plus sign in between them, right? So what we arrive at is two uncoupled equations. They've, they've decoupled into this equation and this one. And we look at these two now closely. Consider the case of very small momenta. Very small momenta, but the mass hasn't disappeared. So for small momenta, this term and this term drop out, and I get C squared for the chi. Okay? That's what we get, and that you get your heads around it. So these two equations, let's, let's get rid of that now. Let's rearrange these equations.
get that. But have solutions like this. Respond to positive energy. Yes, electrons. Positrons are an antimatter that Dirac's equation forecasts, and they were eventually found by Anderson. Um, experimentally, I mean. So, we have, why these are positive and negative energy states, we have to say a little bit more about. From that, for now, you can just take my word for it, uh, which is a bad thing to do. And at the moment, you're also taking my word about the this Pauli matrices. I didn't explicitly write them down. For example, I can't exactly remember what way they go. Something like this. But you'd have to check, right? Pound spin matrices, you'd have to look them up. Next time when I look at them more closely, I'll write them down explicitly. But they do have the property that And we invoke that property just to, to find a representation for our alpha matrices, okay? So that's good for now, and we have more coming on this. I thought that was a neat little lecture. I took a lot of stuff and digested it up for you, by the way. That's what happens usually. So now the next time we're going to look closely at the Pauli matrices. To do that, we have to start talking about angular momentum. And we will try and show how the Pauli matrices show up if not full, a full derivation, we will see. Thank you.